Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honourable speakers and esteemed judges. Today we are debating the motion that this house has lost faith in charity. Great House are, in, are proposing whilst Jones Kitchen are in our position. Without further ado, let me introduce Great House's first speaker, Rowan. Mr Chairman, honourable speakers, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed judges. Today, Great House are proposing the motion that this House has lost faith in charity. I will open our arguments with a clear definition of this motion and by discussing inefficiencies within charitable organisations. Ed will then follow me by giving an analogy and providing a solution to this problem, and Max will finish with a summary of our points and a rebuttal of the oppositions. Whilst charity can have several meanings, we have chosen to use that definition provided by the Cambridge English Dictionary, which states that a charity is a system of giving money, food or help for free to those who are in need because they are ill, poor or have no home. We also need to explain what we mean by the phrase, this house has lost faith. Of course, we do not intend to imply that charities do no good for the world, because they do. Instead, we believe that charities do not fulfil their primary function of solving the inequalities that are abundant within today's society, including poverty, homelessness and disease. During this debate, Great House will show that charities are not treating the root cause of these issues, rather, they're just curing the symptoms. For the past seven years, the level of homelessness in the UK has been on the rise. In fact, according to the UK government, more than four times as many people were made homeless in 2017 than in 2010. This is despite the fact that the number of charities dedicated to helping the homeless has significantly, significantly increased in that time, and so is the amount of money donated. So, what can we conclude from this? Well, perhaps charities don't have the impact that is often claimed. The opposition might well claim that I'm cherry-picking a single statistic here to support my point, but there are many other examples. For example, according to the World Health Organization, the average life expectancy across the world in the past 15 years has increased by five years due to advancements in medicine. However, due to the failure of charities to distribute these modern medicines throughout African countries, the life expectancy for an African has only increased by two years in the past 15 years. See, I could go on, but I think I've made my point clear. Charities do not have the effect that people believe. Why? Because they're not treating the root cause of these issues. Consider for a moment a UK where homelessness has been eradicated. You might think that this has solved our current homelessness crisis, but it hasn't. Just because we're taking people off the streets does not mean they're going to stop coming. People are made homeless for any number of reasons, ranging from drug abuse to lack of education to unemployment. And until we solve these issues, homelessness will still be a major problem in this country. It's not that we do not believe that these problems will never be solved, just that the charities we, can't rely, we currently rely on will not be the solution in their current state, and this is why we're losing faith. So, what is it that's so bad about their current states? You don't have to look any further than the recent Oxfam scandal to see that charities are rife with problems. I'm sure that the opposition will claim that this Oxfam scandal was a one-off and not a fair representation of charities as a whole, and to some degree, they are right. These scandals are not solely responsible for our lack of faith, but they play a significant part. Also, these scandals are not few and far between. Major charities such as Greenpeace and Amnesty International have both experienced several major financial scandals in the past few years. Meanwhile, Save the Children gives six-figure salaries to 28 of its top executives in Europe alone, and Oxfam spends more, of half its, more than half of its income on administration. The evidence is clear. Whilst charities do do a lot of good throughout the world, they are unable to fulfil their purpose of reducing inequality, the purpose that people throughout the world clearly expect them to do. Ed will continue our arguments by providing a realistic solution to the problems that face us today. But for now, let me say this. Charity, whilst fundamental to our society, is not the solution to poverty, homelessness or inequality, and we cannot treat it as such. Thank you. We'll give our judges some time to conclude. Now I will welcome Jones Kitchen's first speaker. Sorry, what was the speaker's name? NASA. What you have failed to mention is the very definition of faith. You see, today's proposition is that you have lost faith in charities. Faith means to have a strong belief in something and that you trust in it to bring good. But let me ask you this, ladies and gentlemen. 
If a teacher makes a type of mistake in or out of the classroom, is the entire educational system unflawed and unfaithful? Flawed and unfaithful? You see, it is unfair to call something that plays such an important role in today's society untrustworthy. So, this leads me into our argument. Good afternoon, adjudicators and fellow debaters. I am Natsak Bayar, the first speaker of the opposition team against the motion that we have lost faith in charities. I will be discussing why charities play an absolutely vital role in today's society and harsh conditions, and how it is unfair to make assumptions on charity in whole due to some incidents that have occurred in the past. Our second speaker, Jamie Schluter, will be explaining how very many good people are where they are due to charities and what exactly most charities do with the investments and why it is our duty as human beings to assist one another. Our final speaker, Jake Hurst, will be finishing us off by summarizing uh, our points and rebutting the opposition's points. Now, on to mine. To, to start off, we don't donate to charity because we have to, but because it's the right thing to do. It's about sticking together as a human race and aiding each other in times of need. Today in the 21st century, we need charities more than ever. Civil wars are forcing people from their homes. Diseases are killing people at a fast rate, and the less fortunate cannot get a proper education simply because they can't afford it. Now, one of the big examples of this is the Big Lottery Fund, which has been operating since 2004 and has awarded over £6 billion to over 130,000 projects. One of these many projects includes the Forces in Mind movement that has a £35 million investment in aiding veterans who, the very people who keep this country safe and where it is today, to have a healthy life after their service. Now, point of information. Yes. Uh, you can name all the charities you want and all the good they do, but it does not change the facts were and outlined that we've lost faith in the idea of charities being the permanent solution to these problems and the issues you're outlining are only temporary solutions. All right, thank you. Uh, our third speaker will answer your point. Now. The big issue driving people out of their homes in 2017 was civil war. Big charities like the British Red Cross have helped over 120,000 asylum seekers into the UK and helped secure safe homes for them. So if you don't see charity as a viable option to help these innocent civilians out of your war zones, then what would be your suggestion? This leads me to my next point. It is easy to look at cases like what happened in Oxfam with with the Oxfam employee in Haiti and immediately make the assumption that charities cannot be trusted. Why should the entire industry of charities suffer due to the stupidity of some individuals? Think of the charity industry like a big apple tree. If you approach it and the first apple you saw was a rotten apple, would you make the assumption that all of them were rotten? You see, just like this, it is only what the media shows you that you actually take into thought because they only sell the rotten apples because in today's world, good apples don't sell. People, good news doesn't sell. People only hear about bad things because have you ever noticed how your parents only get the bad ISAMs? So, I, so to end my speech, I urge you ladies and gentlemen, look at the rest of the tree. Thank you. Again, give the judges some time to complete. Now, I welcome Great House's second speaker, Ed. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, honourable speakers, esteemed judges, ladies and gentlemen, JK claimed that concentrating on giving money to veterans is a, a viable thing to do. But as we know, veterans aren't self-sufficient. So why is this helpful? I digress. Picture this, a lifeboat with space for 100 people. 90 people are currently on board and the remaining 10 space is filled with supplies. This lifeboat encounters 100 people afloat in the water. Of course the people on board want to save as many lives as possible. So they can throw out the supplies and fit 10 more people on board. However, this only gives the appearance of saving lives. After all, there are still another 90 people still in the water. And who knows how many more people could end up in the same predicament. So perhaps there is another way. System two. Instead of chucking away the supplies, they could construct another boat 
with room for all 100 people in the water. American philosopher Garrett Hardin first proposed this lifeboat analogy, and whilst not perfect, it is eerily similar to the predicament we face in modern world. The original lifeboat represents the UK, and those in the water represent those desperately in need of help. In the real world, charities do work akin to the first solution, helping a small percentage of those in need, and only providing a temporary solution. And unfortunately, this is not enough. We need a more permanent solution, much like the second option provided in this analogy. You might ask, well, what solution are we proposing? Well, for this, we would like to direct your attention to the experts, or more accurately, a sofa Ojama, someone who grew up in poverty and has seen firsthand the failings of charity to some of the most important issues. And he has a solution, innovation. In a riveting talk at a recent TEDx event, he discussed failure of charities and proposed that the solution was not to keep throwing money at these situations. Later on in his speech, he talked about a country where he described had a life expectancy of 45, an infant mortality of 18%, and only where 10% of people went through secondary education. To most people, it would seem that he was describing an African country, but in fact he was describing statistics accurate to USA 150 years ago. And the most important thing that we can note from this is how they became the booming economy yet yeah, later that they are today, innovation. And this is the solution that our drummer suggests. Instead of concentrating on aid, we should encourage innovation throughout the poorest countries in the world to help them move towards being better and happier places. Yes, accepted? Um, according to Trust or Trust, there were 500,000 people using food banks last year in the UK. You're basing your motion on, on, on an Oxfam, Oxfam, not charity. This has nothing to do with Oxfam. This is um, a Jama Asafa who, was, um, who did a TEDx talk and he obviously knew exactly what was happening. And food banks have nothing to do with this. We, um, we, were, we are proposing that um, we should step away from these problems of food banks and that we should make a more viable uh, solution, which Ajama suggested should be um, innovation. I digress. This is only one of many solutions. Teva Sineki, CEO of the most influential non-profits in the world, suggested that we are simply giving out food and money without using this and without addressing the issues that cause these problems. Simply giving poor more money is like treating cancer by building more cemeteries. It only addresses the consequences. Sineki proposed that we should not only concentrate on the individuals who are already homeless, bankrupt or unemployed, but rather on the systems which are keeping them there. Could you bring your speech to a close? Please? Of course. I would like to end with a quote. Ending poverty is like trying to get a C in an exam. You're only doing enough to get by, nothing more. And I definitely don't want to be living in a world where we only do enough to get by. That is why I have lost faith in charity. Thank you. We will again give the judges some time to conclude. I now welcome J James Kitchen's second speaker, Jamie. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow debaters, honourable chair, our faithful inspirational head boy, Uriel Pallaby, publicly announced his fortunate charitable bursary on the 8th of January. His bursary is 100% from the Springboard Foundation, thus showing what kind of excellence comes from char charitable foundations like this. My inspirational fellow student, who came from a less fortunate background and was given the opportunity to benefit from a great Milford education. Some of us have been lucky enough to see Uriel's progress from Gladesmore Community School and Millfield. To me and countless others, he's inspired us to believe anything is possible. So from humble beginnings in Tottenham to a head boy at Millfield, he has demonstrated to us a perfect example of what opportunities one can get from exceptional charities such as Springboard. Do we want to risk not getting another person like Uriel because we don't have faith in charities? My second point. The media has the power to manipulate our minds to believe large charitable corporations such as Oxfam are bad with spending our donations. Is this just not Your another... Accepted. 
Um, you seem to be claiming that uh, telling us the facts is manipulating our minds. Thank you. I'll leave that to my third speaker, Jake, to uh, rebuttal against. Is this just not another case of the media being used to support the views of their incredibly rich, tax-avoiding <coughs> owners? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the media is spinning exactly what they want us to hear. We're all lapping up, we're all lapping up the Brexit-fueled isolation narrative. Believe it or not, there is life beyond Britain's borders, and in some cases, there are lives which are depending on us. My third point, our opposition may say that charities are corrupt, scandalous. But in this day and age, what isn't corrupt and scandalous? Everything from Hollywood to the NHS, the fundamental issue is that no system will ever be perfect, and this is largely due to greed and, in some cases, incompetence. Our opposition may say that they have lost faith in charity. The argument is, in the world that we live in, the divide between the haves and the have-nots is so vast that it's easy to lose faith in charities when you're one of the haves. Here you're sitting in our £35,000 per year private school, which incidentally is also a charity, in a not-so-sunny Somerset, denied, arguing about how awful charities are. Is this not a complete farce? At a basic £1 a meal, that's 35,000 children who will be going to bed tonight with a full tummy. And by the way, that's for each of you. On the basis of this, how dare you lose faith in charity? What will happen to Africa if your proposal became a widespread way of thinking? First of all, people will die. Not only from a lack of food, clean water, essential drugs, but also from a lack of necessary vaccines, which ironically we've already debated about this year. Those who don't die will end up needing to go somewhere else. So yes, you guessed it, illegal immigration to Europe. This would skyrocket. There is no way to sugarcoat this. It will be catastrophic. Not to mention all the social effects it will have from outbreaks of disease, increase to rural, rural to urban migration, which will cause chaos and crisis. In the long term, could we ever expect countries like Sudan, Ethiopia, or Sierra Leone to pick up the pieces and rebuild without charity? I'd like to conclude. The human race is one big family. The indescribable feeling of unity, solidarity, and harmony, harmony is what the world thrives off of. Mahatma Gandhi said, love is the strongest force the world processes. So my brothers, my sisters, let's help our siblings across the globe. Charity may start at home, but we cannot allow, it, allow one or two greedy, stupid people to prevent us celebrating our hum humanity. The golden rule states, do to others as you would have them do to you. So help, because maybe you'll require it later. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe in equality. I believe in solidarity. But most of all, I believe in supporting others. Thank you. We'll let the judges conclude. And now welcome JK's final, third and final speaker, Jake. Honourable Chair, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to rebut some of the proposition's points. Firstly, you mentioned that we cannot target the root of the problem and that we are only getting rid of some symptoms. However, I think that's the most efficient way of doing it. Targeting the root will cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. I agree that the life, expense, life expectancy has gone up by five years and because of medical research. However, I like to think that mo most of that money has come from donations and charity. Your first point of information, you said that this does not change how charities are unfaithful. However, Charities do more good than bad. As Jamie said, nothing is perfect. It's impossible to reach a 100% efficient charity. When your boat analogy, I would probably save 10 people rather than none because I would still have made a change in those 10 people. 
this is uh, what you are suggesting is that is that this is a temporary solution. How it, it is not. It is more permanent as it will not lose its impact over time. By helping countries, we you suggest innovation. Yes, that is true. However, what we are doing right now is innovation through charity. It's better, it's better to do something than to do nothing. So when you say that it's, it's not good to have a C, I think I'd prefer to have a C than have a U, which is what you're suggesting if we lose faith in charity. When you, when you say that facts, are, fact, facts say the truth, we don't get all the facts. We only get the ones that make charities look bad. We do not consume all of them, as NASA said. So, to recap our points. NASA mentioned how charities are vital in today's society because of civil wars in the Middle East or disease outbreaks in Africa. The media has only been portraying the bad aspects of charity, such as Oxfam. However, we forget all the good they do in our society. We seem to be basing all our faith on mistakes made by in individuals in only a few organizations. This is quite unfair. As well, because of this, society assumes that charities, like Oxfam, are like the media portrays them. Do you really think that everyone in Oxfam made the stupid mistakes that all these individuals have done in Haiti? I didn't think so. In situations like this, the organization prefers not to be associated with the matter. However, You've, for you've forgotten that members of the Haiti government were also involved. We sometimes forget to see the entire picture because the news tells us what we want to know. If all of Oxfam were involved in this case, I think the story would be much different. Um, and I'm not surprised that people are still donating towards Oxfam. It's because we've still not lost faith in them. Jamie spoke about the benefits of charity and what they've brought us, such as our head boy. And will we really want to risk losing this just because we don't have faith? Seems like a shame. Um, as a global society, we must help each other in times of need. Countries right now depend on us to help them through, uh, through thanks to humanitarian acts. Losing that would result in a loss of trust between the UK and the countries that we aid right now. Without our aid, ch uh, countries cannot hold up during times of tragedy and war. They rely on us. So let me ask you this to finish off. If a child was drowning in front of you, would you go in the water and save him? Obviously you would. Well now, let's imagine this. He is not physically in front of you, and the only way to save him is to donate to charity. Would you? See, by taking a more objective and rational approach to these matters, we can see what we do with our time, abilities, and money, and we start to realize how much of a difference we can make in the world. Thank you. We give our judges time to conclude. And now welcome Grace, final speaker. Max. Mr. Chairman, honourable speakers, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed judges. JK began today's debate by attempting to undermine our definition of the motion, which, as Rowan said, and may I remind you, is our right as the proposition to do. They then continue to emphasise throughout their speeches that we only hear bad things about the media, that we only hear the negatives such as the Oxfam scandals. But perhaps you have not watched much news because you are constantly seeing adverts for charities and news of all the good charities have done. And as you provided, there are so many statistics showing the good that charities have done. But you seem to concentrate on your arguments by saying that we're trying to get rid of charities, we're trying to remove them from the world, have none of them left. He said, how dare we get rid of charities? How dare we stop all the good that these are doing? And Jake seemed to claim that by treating the symptoms, we'd able to be able to cure a much, much larger problem. But we can't, because if, how would you cure a disease? Not by curing the symptoms, but by treating the disease itself. You can't expect 
to solve all these international crises by simply treating the symptoms. You can't remove the homeless off the streets and expect homelessness to no longer be a problem. You can't expect to give some of the poor money and expect that to no longer be a problem. You put, gave an example of veterans, which I thank you for because that supports our point, because charities are pouring more and more money into giving veterans support. Yet veterans are going to keep on coming. You've got to find a more permanent solution, a way to help veterans be self-sufficient after they've fought for our country. You claimed in a point of information, and then Jake again did in his summary, that we are basing our entire argument off this Oxfam scandal and other scandals surrounding it. But we are not. That was merely a side note Mark Rowan made in his first speech. We are concentrating on this idea that treating the symptoms does not cure a disease. And you did cite that all the good charities have done. And that is something we have accepted. We accept charities do good. Ryan agreed with me here, so did Ed. You cited the school. And yes, charities do do a huge amount of good for the world. And we're not saying they should, they should stop doing that. We're saying that there are better ways for them to do good for the world. And as Jamie said, lives are depending on us. And yes, lives are depending on us. As Ed suggested in his analogy, at the moment we're only saving a small percentage of those who are out there needing our help. Whereas in reality, if we look at innovation, if we look at the solutions someone like Sinecki suggests, we would find we're saving many, many more lives. And Jake tried to refute this analogy of a lifeboat by saying he would much rather save ten lives than none. But that was what not, the, not what the analogy was showing. The analogy showed that it would be much better to take time and attempt to save a hundred lives than to save ten. And these ten represent the small proportion of people who charities are providing with money and help, um, compared to the hundred representing the huge number of impoverished people who are in desperate need of help throughout the world and who can only be helped through a permanent solution. And you seem to suggest, Jake, that charities are come under the category of innovation, that they are something new, people inventing things. But charity has been around for decades, centuries. Giving to people has been around since the dawn of civilization, since humans first existed. Charities are not innovation. Charities can help to co encourage innovation, which they're not doing at the moment, which is something we should look towards them doing. So to summarise, JK seemed to have come to this debate and argued against a, a load of points that we simply have not made. They've virtually ignored our main point that we need to treat the cause of these problems, not the symptoms. And when Jake did briefly brush on this point, he gave a flawed argument. We do not want to disband charities. We do not want to say that charities do no good throughout the world, because they do. But we have lost faith in charities because they are simply not the permanent solution that this world, those people starving in Africa, those people homeless on the streets of Britain, the inequality that is shown throughout the world, that is what we need. Thank you. Now, whilst the judges are deliberating, we'll have a quick vote. Could you please raise your hand if you are in favour of the... Um, so, of the question, the great, the great house. Okay, and if you're not, if you're opposing it, right. Thank you. Um, I would like to say thank you very much indeed. I've had the most fantastic time here, and it's been really interesting listening to your arguments, all of you. I'd like to thank you for everything that you put into it. I'm going to make some individual comments, um, which I hope will help all of you. And the reason for why I'm doing that is because I'm here in Millfield and you're all Millfield. All right? So I would not do this in a public deba debate um, otherwise. But I'd just like to make some general comments about individual people. So, if I start, if I may, with Rowan. Rowan. Um, I wanted to say, it, you set out really clearly the case um, 
you made some really good, you were confident and clear, um, and there were some things that you said, things like six-figure salaries, half of which go to administration. The only criticism I would make, perhaps, is that you seemed very calm, and sometimes we need to put a real bit of passion into everything. So I would say that that's something that you might want to develop. And I think there was an awfully long time, it was actually only in the last minute, that the scandals that are wrapped around the charity sector at the moment were mentioned. So you might have made a stronger point there. Um, I think if I now... Um, I'd like to talk about Ed and his contribution. I thought you introduced people really well. I was terribly flattered by being an esteemed judge. It's very helpful. Um, if, you, if you lay on the flattery, sometimes it works. Um, you're a steady and clear speaker. Um, you dismissed the POI very clearly, and you delayed but then responded to it, and you brought the whole argument back on course quite well. I have to say, going over time a little bit, because you were diverted by the point of information. Um, there was a good explanation of why you agreed with the proposition, but perhaps it might have been good to address a few more of the points that have been raised otherwise. So that was good. Um, Max, I think that you seem to own the space. I was really pleased to see that you'd actually made very few notes you weren't speaking to notes all the time. You'd really made just pointers of the things that you needed to, to deal with. And you made a good summary. And you directed your comments personally to those on the other side, which was good. You seemed to speak from the heart. You had endless passion, which I thought was brilliant. Um, so well done. And I think there were a number of things that you said, you know, talking about treating um, the core, not the symptoms, and having a clarity of ease in your summing up. That was really good. Your position on stage was really, really good. So, now what I want to do is talk about... Where are we? Sorry, forgive me. Back onto my other bits of notes. Um, so, Nasa, you're... I think you have quite a low um, voice. Your register is quite low. And for that reason, you would need to project your voice more, because it's quite hard, I think, for some people to hear what you're saying. Your points were well made, but I think it would be fair to say that you need to practice throwing your voice more at your audience um, and possibly to speak a little more slowly um, so that people can catch what you're saying, because what you're saying is good, but it needs to be picked up by your audience more. Um, you went straight in with your rebuttal, which I thought was, um, I, I was a bit surprised by that, um, and an almost conversational style. I think you might have helped your own case a little more if you'd been able to just say, as the others did, perhaps, you know, introduce, give people a little bit of time. Um, you don't have to say esteemed judges, but it's quite nice to just address the people that you're talking to. Um, you made some good arguments of your own, which were clearly stated. Um, I, and I thought one of the things you did particularly well was the visual picture of the apple tree, which I thought was really helpful. You, I think there were occasions when this team passed on the points of information. But you were good in saying things like, this leads me to my next point. And you were very clear in your definition of who would do what on your team. Um, Jamie, wow. Um, really good rhetoric. Um, I think you brought the whole argument in to... It, you drew my attention and probably your audiences as well by bringing in the head boy, the local connections, the strength springboard charity. It made it really relevant to what we were listening to. And it's really good to focus the mind. The other thing is the use of stats like 35K, 35,000, is good because it's, it makes people wake up and focus on the points that you made. Um, you were very clear. You had good gestures. You turned to your fellow debaters. 
and I think some of the things you said, you were very loud, very clear, um, and you said things like, you know, how dare you, with a lot of emotion, all that passion really helps. And you made a direct appeal. You said, I, I uh, appeal directly to my brothers, to my sisters. And I just felt, right, okay, fine, I'm right with you. So it's a good device. Um, and you denied and accepted a point of information, which was good. Um, I thought that was, uh, it was a really good, you, you show some charisma, which is very helpful when you're trying to pers be persuasive with your arguments. And so the next person I have to talk about, ooh, have I got that wrong, the right way around? Yes. Um, uh, so, Jake, is that right? Have I got your name right? Yes, that's right. So, forgive me. Um, I thought you addressed the issues well. You had confidence. I think um, I felt you were being sincere and your timing was spot on. And you had a really good analogy of the drowning child, going back to that boat picture in people's head. I thought that was really particularly good. I have to say, you had the most difficult job, um, both of you did, in actually drawing together everything. Um, but I'm going to say to you that we've, we've considered everything. And it has to be said that on this occasion, we would judge that actually, by a whisker, Great, great house have won this debate. Thank you.